So I see gunpowder is really, we're positioning ourselves as the start of the, the new studio system. So if you look at the, what I would call like this first version of the studios way back when, the production entity of the studio was obviously integrated all the way through to exhibition because they were allowed to own theaters. Then, of course, that law, the, through the law, they were broken. And then the studios are the system that all of us here kind of grew up with. So studios that largely were doing all the production, financing, and distribution to the theaters themselves, but never had any connection with the consumer. So you had to put it up on the theater and let Regal or AMC or whoever tell you what was going on. Now, in the new version, the new studios that are forming, everyone has a direct relationship with the consumer. I, I think I don't need to say anything, really. I think we're done. <laughs> Are we done? We're done. Um, so I'm Janet. Um, I head up distribution at Gunpowder and Sky. I assume most people don't know what Gunpowder and Sky is, but you just watched that video. So any questions? <laughs> Are we good? OK, <laughs> fine. Um, so I'll tell you, because uh, I, I said to these guys, let's just play the video while everyone's talking. And I think we agreed there was a small volume decrease in conversation. Somewhere around the lesbian sex or breast slide, I think the room came to attention. So thanks. Um, I actually made this video, and it obviously doesn't have sound, because uh, we were at MIP, which is obviously the TV market in Cannes a couple weeks ago. And uh, you, have, you put like a screener at your booth, and people walk by and you know, and everyone else has like some movie trailers or something happening. And we decided, okay, let's do this. And when it's playing, it's like a conference center. So you obviously don't have sound on your video. So we were putting in our shows and obviously you saw the little title cards at the bottom. And I said, why don't we just put those sexually oriented little place cards throughout? Because I'm sure people will stop at our booth because everyone's going to be like, what the heck is going on with this company? It worked. Um, so thanks for proving once again it kind of gets attention. But that's what we're doing with our content and that's what we're doing with the company. Um, does everyone know where the name Gunpowder and Sky comes from? Because I didn't. Um, it's an Amy Mann song. Uh, it's from a lyric of her song, Fourth of July. There you go. Um, and what it means for us is we're doing things differently. Um, we're making cool content. We're making it in all different formats. What you saw right there were screeners. Some of those are full length features. Some are short form series. Some are the one with the guys doing the whole thing, um, Too Stupid to Die. It's obviously a prank style series, uh, a little bit in the vein of Jackass, and we're currently um, doing that with MTV. So it's a full kind of TV series. So we're all across the map in terms of all different kinds of formats. And um, I thought it would be interesting, and fortunately David also thought it would be interesting, to talk about distribution when we're talking about different kinds of content. Because normally when people talk about distribution, it's in the context of, okay, it's a movie or it's a certain kind of thing. But Gunpowder and Sky is a studio. We're distributing all different kinds of things. So the way that you distribute something that's uh, 10 two-minute episodes or something that is a traditional TV series or something that's a movie is different. And we're orienting our content, as you probably could tell, to people under 30, kind of like seven, 17 to 29 is the sweet spot. And thinking about, OK, what kind of format is it? Where is my audience? You completely rethink distribution. And that's what we're doing every day. Um, we're, we don't try and put our movies in theaters all the time. We don't try and put our TV shows on TV. We put them where the content makes sense and where the audience is going to find it. Um, and we try to have fun doing it. And as you can see, we don't take ourselves too seriously at all. And if at any point in this presentation I'm taking myself too seriously, just yell. it will be totally fine. Um, OK, so I think what I'm going to do is run you guys through a couple of case studies of film, different kind of things we've done, and talk about distribution. But before I do that, I wanted to know who I'm talking to. Is everybody a producer or what do people do? Other distributors, producers? Any, most, peop most people producers? And actors? OK. Um, so I think just shout if there's any. I'll stop after I do kind of each case study. And if you have specific questions about that film or whatever we did on it, maybe you can just shout before I go on to the next one. Does that work? 
cool. Yeah. Thank you. Love that question. Um, so we do both. So what you saw right there is actually a mixed bag. So the Too Stupid to Die is something we're producing ourselves. Um, there's a movie that I'll talk about in more detail where everyone's wearing nun habits. Um, that one we bought at Sundance. So we do third party distribution as well as for our own. Um, and as we go, actually everything that I'm, uh, the last one I'm talking about today is one of our original productions. But everything else I'm talking about is actually something that was a third party acquisition. And we'll do third party acquisitions across all formats as well. So mo mostly features, but we're really not biased. Cool? Good? All right. Let's try it. OK, so I'm starting with the most traditional one first. Um, before Gunpowder and Sky, I ran a distribution company called FilmBuff. Um, and I sold it to Gunpowder about a year ago. This was um, a film that we picked up right in that moment of transition, which is why you're like, she was just talking about stuff for under 30 and fun. And this does not look like that. You're correct. Um, so let me, let's just run the trailer, and then I'll give you a bit more about this. What are we going to learn? You're going to learn why Herbalife is going to collapse. Bill Ackman is on a holy war. A couple times we come across a company we think is causing harm. We can make money betting against that company. Herbalife stock goes down, we make money. Herbalife stock goes up, we lose money. And that's short selling. How much money have you spent betting against Herbalife? Over a billion dollars. What are you accusing Herbalife of? Of being a pyramid scheme. This is a legitimate company. That's a bogus accusation. Multi-level marketing. They tap into beliefs we have that you can accomplish whatever you want to. The wildest dreams you've ever thought of can come true in Herbalife. They took my dreams, my hope to be successful. Yo perdí 16 mil dólares. Estaba invirtiendo 1,600 dólares o más. 22 mil dólares. The kind of people that can do that, I mean, they're crooks. Carl Icahn, the famed hedge fund trader, taking out a big stake in the company, pretty much because he hates Bill Ackman. Since then, we saw the stock double. Ackman is a liar. He was like one of these little Jewish boys crying that the world was taking advantage of him. He essentially could crush Ackman short. I bought it because I really think it's a good product. He's not there because he believes in Herbalife's product. He's doing it because he thinks he can make money by squeezing Bill Ackman. This industry is going to continue to burn people. We haven't penetrated the markets and communities anywhere close to what we're going to see. And you, with us, it's family, and nobody messes with the family. Okay. Uh, so, did anyone see the film? Does anyone know the story? Yeah? Do you like the movie? You don't have to say yes. Yeah? Yeah? Cool. Um, Bill Ackman was in the news again today, because now he's taking on ADP, the payroll folks. So the guy's always in the news. Fortunately for us, he's always in the news. Um, so it kind of seems like an esoteric documentary, uh, like financial stuff and kind of, you know, but as the actual arc of the film has got two things. It's the dramatic arc of the two billionaires taking each other on, but it's about a huge population of largely Latino and Hispanic folks who have been swept along for the ride. And it's incredibly sad and poignant stories about the money that they've lost and all the stuff that's happened with this pyramid scheme. So it's. There's this financial intrigue piece. There's the fact that this guy is constantly in the news. And then there's this horrible kind of, is that me? Um, horrible kind of uh, victimization and kind of social policy angle. All these things together. So usually with a film like this, it's, there's, Bill Ackman is not necessarily a name that's going to open theatrically. So <laughs> for us, when we were thinking about distribution, we're like, does the movie have enough grit to make sense to try and do something other than, for example, sell it to Netflix and just call it a day, which is what a lot of documentaries do now, as I'm sure everybody knows. Um, 
At Sundance, obviously, uh, they acquired eight or nine documentaries just straight out, and they had basically no theatrical. So our thing about this was, does it have enough grit? Is there enough of a hook? Can we do something with it? And we decided, yes, because take a risk, get the story out. And by taking it theatrically and doing kind of a longer push and not just putting it to SPOD, we could ensure that we got the story in front of all the audiences that we thought would respond. So we thought the Wall Street guys and people that kind of follow the sort of inside job type folks would respond, and we were right. That segment completely responded. We did a lot of work for the Hispanic market. We hired um, a woman who's a really connected in Washington with the various lobbying groups to kind of help us figure out how to get, get the film in front of that community and how to do it in a really respectful way um, so that people felt their cause was actually being shared and more people were aware of what was going on. Um, and of course, you have the traditional doc crowd, just like the normal folks that love to see what's on at the Art House Cinema. So we did that. We actually put the film, we did a very kind of long, limited theatrical run. So about a month of special screenings, things here and there, little festival runs kind of going along. And then we released it, uh, we kept the theatrical screenings going, and then we released it day and date on iTunes. The film uh, was number one on iTunes for five weeks in the documentary section. So you notice how I left it and then I caveat it. Um, number one in the documentary section. Um, but number one in the documentary section, I'm here to tell you can make money. Uh, and it did. Um, we put a lot of P&A behind this to support a doc, which is always a bit of a risk. And it paid back. The film still has legs. Um, and we, every time we do something with it, or Ackman's in the news as he was today, or we do anything to draw attention to the film again, it pops. So it was a really interesting story of, for us, like, if you really believe in a doc and you believe it has an audience and a really important message, you want to distribute it in a way that gives it a chance to breathe. Um, and so we're particularly proud of what we did with that one. If anyone hasn't seen it, it's far more interesting than you would think it would be. It's not just kind of like a financial thing. It's really the two guys, the power grab, and this whole population of people getting us swept along for the ride, and of course, um, what your take is on Herbalife. And the movie does not, uh, it leads you to believe one thing, but it's not coming down super strongly. It does lead you to believe they are the bad guys, but it does cause and engender a lot of conversation and debate, and that's always fun when you're distributing a documentary to have something that kind of people want to talk about and have a conversation about. So, yeah. Uh, oh, does everyone know what that screenshot is there? This is from iTunes. So that kind of promotion right here, the big box. So do, where do people watch movies? Not on iTunes. No? Everyone does Netflix. Whew, did you not hear what I said? OK. Um, <coughs> no, we love Netflix. But uh, we, do, we do firmly believe in the TVOD window and uh, for great content that will people either will go to the theater or rent it or buy it. Um, the SPOD services are also great. Seriously, everyone, Netflix only? No. Nope. iTunes, Amazon, anyone? Prime. Only Prime, or are you paying? Prime. <laughs> okay, this is a tough room. Okay. <laughs> uh, and does anyone do buying or renting on like, what's the cable service here? Is it Comcast or? Yeah, does anyone do, does anyone do movie renting and buying on Comcast? A little bit? A little bit, okay. Um, so that's pretty typical, uh, just so you guys know, when we first started in this digital distribution business, pretty much iTunes had a lock on it. Amazon's come a long way um, on the TVOD side, and really uh, now both of them have a lot of the business, and uh, Spectrum, the new Time Warner, and Comcast are huge as well. So everyone pretty much, if you're gonna be buying or renting, that's largely where you're doing it. Other services that distribute in the same window are Xbox, PlayStation, Voodoo, um, and Google Play. So all of those kind of, when we talk about releasing movies in this window, those are the platforms it goes to. Um, so my point about this, iTunes, Snapchat, when iTunes gives you this kind of promotion for a film, it's really big. And that helps to drive stuff like getting to number one and staying there. If, for those of you that go to iTunes or to Amazon, you know like you're a human. So if the film isn't featured, 
anywhere and it's just kind of like buried down somewhere, you're basically, how much time in the day do you have? Not enough to go searching. So as a distributor, you always want to make sure that you're going to be putting a film up there that's going to get featured to help people find it. And this was it for Docs. Okay. Yep. Oh, there. So it's the same. Pro so it's the same process. So um, Docs, iTunes is really great about providing editorial and curatorial stuff. So if you're going to some of the other platforms, Amazon in particular, they they don't have as strong an editorial and curatorial bent. Most of the Amazon stuff, like for those of you that use it, there's shelves and it'll say like new releases or popular comedies or 99 cents now or whatever. Those are largely algorithmic. So like the stuff that says trending. So nobody's sitting there consciously thinking like, hey, what does the Amazon consumer want to watch? And if you're Amazon, that makes sense because the Amazon consumer is largely everyone. Not true for iTunes. There is a distinct kind of uh, consumer that iTunes is programming for, and iTunes users tend to be a little bit more eclectic with their film taste. iTunes does a great job of featuring documentaries, probably more so than anyone else. And so when we have a great doc, we talk to them and we make a case for that. So that just doesn't happen by like fluke. You kind of make a case. And part of our value as a distributor is that you're kind of negotiating for, this is basically merchandising. Like if, you know, whenever you go to a store, stuff is featured at the end of the aisle. This is basically the equivalent of that. You have to have a good movie and make a good case. <clears throat> for iTunes, for iTunes. That's not true. For Amazon, it's, of course, pay to play. So, uh, and the prices are very high. So, which is why, for those of you that use Amazon, they have a similar kind of flow case of the big squares on top. Those cost tons of money, and that's why there's always big studio movies in there. So, you'll see like Guardians and all kinds of stuff in there. Six figures. So, for someone like us, that's just, it doesn't make sense. For the economics of a film like this, you would never, I mean, the, no. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. So this was actually when we were film buff, we had a policy of never paying any MG whatsoever. So this is that. Now at Gunpowder, uh, we are funded by Otter Media, which is a JV between Peter Chernin and AT&T. So we actually do have money and we are paying MGs. But um, this we did not. We put a large investment into the P&A. So working dollars as opposed to MG, which is just a kind of risk mitigation for the producer. Um, pardon? Oh, the minimum guarantee, the advance. Pay. So this gentleman was asking, did we actually pay for the distribution rights for the movie? We did not. But that doesn't mean we didn't financially support it. Instead of financially supporting the release less and paying the MG, we paid zero MG and put all the money towards the promotion of the film, and it paid off. I don't know, because I didn't produce it. So we just picked it up as a third, third party. Um, and yeah. Well, I can't tell you all of that. But um, what I can tell you is that it works. So what, is, what was really interesting on this film and is not true on every other film, so sometimes you put a ton of money into this like theatrical and transactional window, but you make up that money in a later window. So you might like kind of lose money in that window, but it comes back. In this case, it actually made it broke even in the first window. So that would be the equivalent of a studio releasing a movie, and it actually makes money theatrically which as we know never happens. It largely loses money in the theatrical window because there's like a $50 million P&A. So, and then it makes up money in the later windows. This one actually broke even in the first window, which we're really proud of. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this was not a gunpowder <laughs> one, but I do think it's an interesting distribution story and I'm sure there's probably a lot of doc folks here, so I wanted to make sure we covered it. Okay, what's, this is not a doc. Um, I'll let the trailer speak for itself.
Good morning, sister. Hey, don't fucking talk to us. Now get the fuck out of here. Sister Ginevra. Sister Fernanda. Sister Alessandra. Sister Maria. These are your sins. Bling, bling, bitch, do my own thing, bitch. Filthy conversation. Mind your own fucking business. Lustfulness. <laughs> Homosexuality. Did you roll your eyes? No. You were rolling your eyes. Wake up, little bitches. Let me show you how to live. You didn't say it. You've been so good. You're gonna get me fucking killed. Uh-huh. <laughs> Bring me his goddamn balls. Preaching to you little bitches, did you hear what I said? These girls can be tough, I'm not gonna lie. They can be very tough. What is this shit? It's, it's a turnip. That's not a turnip, it's shit! Who are you? It's not fair, you're just stuck here with all these bitches. I'm in the kitchen, so respect my business. Bling, bling, bitch, do my own thing, bitch. Trust me, Father, for I've sinned. I have slept with another man's wife. Sometimes she would place her mouth around my sex. Yeah, well, that's sodomy. I thought sodomy was just when someone would penetrate the rear. That's also sodomy. Right. Did you do that? I, I did. And my thought for love is the rock. Oh, what is wrong with her? She is on drugs. All my hot girls with me. She can be kissed around and bounce those tits. It's the longest list I've ever had. Apostasy, abusive language, heresy, reveling, eating blood. Do you think I've ever written down eating blood before? Where am I? Bling, bling, bitch, do my own thing, bitch. Fuck a wedding ring, that ding a ling was just a fling, bitch. Okay, so not the same. A little, little, little bit different. Um, did anyone see the film, hear about it, see the trailer? Uh, <coughs> it's a bit of a giggle. Um, so, this was our first Gunpowder original feature film release. Uh, we bought the film at Sundance for low seven figures. Um, and we decided that while it skewed a teeny bit old um, for us, it was hilarious, raunchy, fun, purely entertaining, which we figured uh, the country needed this year. <laughs> and uh, and so we j and we knew we could have fun with it, and just have fun with the marketing and uh, enjoy it. So it was our first bet as a studio, and uh, I certainly had never done a traditional theatrical release before. By traditional, I mean like a 90-day window in theaters. I've done all kinds of variations of days and d day and dates and short windows and limited releases, but at Film Buff we never did a traditional theatrical. So we decided on this one to do traditional. Um, my friends who are distributors, and if I had still not been at Gunpowder, I think most distributors would have released this day and date. Um, the film is awesome, but it's the pacing isn't perfect. The cast is fantastic. So, uh, and the reviews were pretty good and they stayed very good. And we were actually weren't sure where the reviews were gonna come out, but the reception at Sundance was amazing. So a risk mitigating distributor would have done a day and date approach. We were like, nope, we're gonna swing for the fences. We can have tons of fun. We think the audience is gonna come into theaters and pay to see it in theaters. It was a big bet um, and we did it. And it was an especially big bet because Sundance movies in general, in, generally in general release in June because by the time you buy it in January and get your act together, it's really impossible to get the movie released before June. So there was one other massive Sundance comedy that came out in June, but they suck. Amazon has a lot of money. Um, and so we knew we were gonna be going right with the big sick and it was trying to find the release date and figure out like, are we gonna be able to get comedy audiences to come? Um, and we ended up releasing it the Friday before July 4th weekend. This was also a big bet because certain people certain ages of people would never stay. We opened it in New York and LA, July 4th weekend. So we took a bet on who would be in the city July 4th weekend. Most people like 35 and above are going out of, the, out of town. So we took the bet that, and I remember myself just last year when I was 28, I was staying in, thanks, thanks, I know, it's good. Uh, <laughs> we, um, I was like, hey, everybody stays in the city. They don't go, they hang out, everyone has the city to themselves, they go around. 
Um, I actually went to the Friday night screening of this movie in New York and the Saturday night to check the hypothesis of the age of person that was going, and we were right. Late 20s were all there. Um, it opened at the Sunshine in New York and uh, the Arclight in LA. It stayed at the Sunshine in New York for 12 weeks. It played and played and played. Um, for those of you that know New York and you know the Sunshine, it's, in, it's uh, just in the north side of Soho and it's great for foot traffic. Everyone's going past the East Village, going to Lower East Side. It was great. Um, so that's what we ended up doing in terms of the logistics. I did want to take a moment because distribution is half distribution, half marketing. So obviously if we were going to take this film out and give it a 90 day window, we had to market it and make sure everyone knew about it. And the one thing that we had to really help us out was that amazing cast. Um, Aubrey is not only in it, she's also a producer and her boyfriend's the director. So that helps, it's a good start. So we decided let's have fun with this. And one of our marketing assets is this other video over here. I'm Sister Kate from Sisters of the Valley. And I'm Sister Evie from Sisters of the Valley. I am Aubrey Plaza from Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, you guys smoke marijuana? Yes, we're the weed yes. nuns. I'm not a weed nun, but I do that. Why do you guys grow weed? The reason we grow weed is to support ourselves and also to create honorable spiritual jobs for women. Here, this is a gift we brought you. This is called Purple Cream. That's not for our medicines. That's for the sister's private medicine cabinet. Okay, dope. When did you start wearing? In 2011, Michelle Obama tried to talk to Congress about how unhealthy our children's meals are. Congress declared pizza a vegetable. Why? Because it made our children's meals look healthier than they are. So I declared myself a nun. I said, if pizza is a vegetable, I'm a nun. People think we're Catholic nuns. They immediately want to share what they know about scripture. Like, John oh, 4, 32. How do I get out of this conversation? Yes. Oh, we're not those nuns. <laughs> Move on. Yeah. And it's not like against the rules to dress like a nun. It's America, really. I think freedom. because I grew up Catholic, like if I see you, well, I mean, I have guilt because I'm Catholic. And this is why we need a new kind of nun. Their model doesn't work anymore. Have you taken vows? And if so, what are they? Oh, first Did I ask they that give weird? you the join. <laughs> chastity, ecology, activism, living That's sweet Sorry, service. can we just there stop we at chastity? Let's not like Let's that. go back. We just privatize our sexuality. Okay. I don't know what that means. Is it hard work growing marijuana? Uh, we have brothers, really, that do the hard work. Nice. <laughs> have you never trimmed a bud? No. Those are real? Whoa. Super nice. These are fat ones. Whoa. Those perks. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen. It's so pretty. Essentially what you're going to do <laughs> is you're going to dig under here for the base of these big leaves. The first I thing you're going to want to do is cut off the big leaves. It's so pretty. Oh god, I did I did it wrong. What? I took all of it. One time I hid a bunch of weed in my saxophone. <laughs> and <laughs> I think my mom found it. <laughs> It's unfortunate that our medical system has been so oppressive in keeping the knowledge of holistic medicine suppressed. But I really think the gig is up. Far the more gig people. is up. Yes, the gig is up. Do you guys believe in a higher power? We believe that there is a creator God that created all this. We are all a different set of eyes for God to look out at his creation and to experience life on this planet. And that we all have a little bit of God in us. I would say that sounds good to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I don't know. Do you pray? I used to a lot, and I don't anymore. It's a good crime, I could find with every step you take, the earth goes down the hole. We believe cannabis oil was the other holy oil of the Bible. Why? Our position is, if Jesus lived, he probably smoked weed. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys saw Aubrey Stone's little alley yesterday. What did you think of it? 
Yes, I was really all set to hate that movie, and then I ended Why? up really liking it. In the teaser trailer thing, it's like they packed up all the trashy moments. Yeah, but so that's what they're doing. They're oh, it's and then it's when I get raunchy. there, it's actually a very delightful story. Yeah, it's raunchy, but the Catholic League said raunchiest. No, it's not the raunchiest. You haven't watched any nun porn movies. <laughs> yes. I'm sort of, <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I said that. Uh, yes, yes. So what you've heard about our order, what do you think? Could you be this? Could you do this? Could you? Yeah. I mean, oh, honestly. You'd be, <laughs> you'd be such I, a pretty. I honestly. <laughs> you'd make such a pretty like, sister. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. Can I still be an actor? Yes, oh, yes, okay. of course. <laughs> I want to be a weed nun. Good. Good. We'll make you a weed nun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
and it's just funny. You know, it's just lighthearted and funny. And so we didn't have to worry. Sometimes when you're distributing a film, it's like, oh, I don't want to overscreen it because we're going to cannibalize the audience. It's not true. It, for this, yes, it is, is a true as an idea, but it wasn't, wasn't true for this one. Um, and uh, it will be going uh, to epics just before Christmas. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing there. We also had a couple of worldwide rights on it. We, Universal had most of the world, but we sold a few territories as well. Uh, Universal took all the easy territories, and we were left selling um, the territories that have huge censorship issues and such easy countries for this movie as France, Spain, and Italy. Um, I'm here to tell you it was really tough. Um, they're not called the Catholic countries for no reason. But we did secure sales in all of them, and we we're excited about that. Um, any more questions about Little Hours? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, So I used to work at Synetic for John Sloss, um, and that was my first job after getting my MBA, because John was one of the guys that actually didn't think that an MBA meant you couldn't go into the film industry. It's pretty cool. Now, actually, most of the people at Netflix and Amazon are, have financial and analytical backgrounds, but it wasn't true uh, in 2006. So um, I knew a lot about selling. For those that don't know, John and Synetic are a very, uh, very well-known independent sales agent. So I knew a lot about being on the sales side. It was really advantageous to go to Sundance knowing what it's like to sell a movie and, in fact, be a buyer. Um, because part of the Sundance magic is that everyone's trying to like, get a deal done at Sundance irrationally at 3 a.m. in the morning. And um, we would just didn't do it. So I just said, it's midnight. I, they, I'm going to bed. Because like, you don't make good decisions after that point. And it, it ultimately, it's like we didn't want to overpay. And so it's, you're human, so you're like, oh, I really got to get it. I don't want to go to bed without getting it. And you end up overpaying for a movie. So we didn't do that. So we just kind of let it go. Uh, we didn't buy into that huge kind of momentum that happens when everyone wants to close there. And so we ended up paying what we thought we should pay, which meant we didn't overpay too much. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, but we did put a ton into P&A. So it's the thing about these movies. It's not just how much you're buying them for. You have to be able to go and really support them. And once it started connecting theatrically, we put a lot more money behind it to keep it going. Um, so you have to be prepared to do that and be able to back that up. Um, OK, so that was that. Um, I think, what's the next one? So this one is just interesting. I'll do it super, I'll do it super quickly just because it's a little bit different from everything else. We did this in the summer. Any racing car fans in the room? Will everyone else be bored if they watch the trailer? <laughs> McLaren, it's cool cars, right? Okay, let's check it out. Yeah. This is the story of a young man from New Zealand. Bruce was an artist. To be able to extract every ounce of what this machine is capable of. McLaren makes 165 miles an hour look easy. A machine that can hurt you. So you don't expect any trouble in the race? Well, I always expect trouble. I just hope we don't have any. Bruce was always one of us. If Bruce had come in and said, we're going to march across the Sahara Desert, we'd have all said, oh, OK, Bruce, no problem. Bruce had an illness from childhood, which had left him crippled. He lay on that frame for two years. From the time he was a boy, he had extraordinary natural ability. What he started with the McLaren team was tremendous. They were Kiwis taking on the world. Bruce was preparing for the future. We were testing on a Can-Am car. All of a sudden, it's just... Silence. I lifted him out of the car and held on to him. I wanted the boys to carry on. The boys, as I always called them, my, my boys. We were all totally dedicated to him. His friendship was simply unconditional. He had the ability to think big. We would like to do a road car in the future. He was building an empire. 
That was his dream. McLaren won every race. It was just unbelievable. McLaren did a daring drive rarely seen in motor racing. I remember my first actual race. It was on a beach. It was probably the slowest race I'll ever win. Uh, I was certainly excited by it. I don't know. I always kind of get shivers from that trailer. It's I don't know. I'm not I'm not a super car person, but he just is such an inspirational dude. And maybe it's because I'm Canadian and I relate to the Kiwis. But um, but it it was really interesting film. One thing that we know is that the um, car audience is super passionate. For those that are on Amazon, you've probably seen Top Gear in your face every single second. There's a reason that that was one of the first global originals that they did. The car audience is global. Um, this is another film that we shared with Universal uh, and the rest of the world. We did domestic on it. Um, a friend of mine runs a company called Screen Vision. If anyone goes to the theater early and you see that pre-show that happens before the movie starts, um, Screen Vision is one of the guys that runs those, runs those shows. So what we did is we partnered with them to market this movie in areas of high affluence and car areas. Greenwich, Connecticut. Arizona, um, uh, LA. So we went by wealth and by the locations of McLaren dealerships. And so we worked with McLaren and their team in the States to figure out how to use the dealerships to help market the film. We did very targeted screenings. It was only like, uh, well, we did, a, we did like screenings around Pebble Beach all over the course of the summer. And then we ended up releasing it right at the end of August. So this was even, is another doc, but it was way more tactical than betting on zero because it is such a specific audience that we really just like drilled in tight. Um, and that one, also the, uh, this kind of film also does really well on iTunes and Amazon. So it's there now. Um, and it is going to be going to stars afterwards. Um, so if you're not a car fan, you probably wouldn't see it. But if you are, you would be telling all your other car fan friends about it. And that's the kind of hook, that's the kind of film we look for, where it's going to be fun and interesting. And the folks that are the audience are going to come out and really go gung-ho for it. So that's that one. And I think just in the interest of time, because I think there's a bar that's serving. Um, and I know people might want to visit it. Yeah, let's do that one. <coughs> So I'm just going to end with this one. Um, let's watch. Well, before I let you see the trailer, I will point out that this is playing right now at the Regal Fenway this weekend. Um, so if you like the movie, you can go immediately after the trailer. I won't be offended. Sometimes I just feel like nothing I do matters, like I'm not special. We only got one retweet today from your mom. Sad. We were just wondering if maybe you could give our blog a shout out. A shout out from me would be a little off brand. I have 15,000 followers. You know what that means? A community like this? <laughs> more to the left. His heart's more to the left. <laughs> just hit him follow, dude. I'm trying. Mr. <laughs> High is trending. I really hope nothing bad happened to him. It's like poof. He vanished, right? Anybody could be next, even you. You can find more information on our Tragedy Girls Twitter page. Your brain is my charisma. You can do anything. Quick soundbite from the Tragedy Girls. Oh, Angie, you can't even kiss right now. Are you afraid that the killer will target you because of your infamous blog? We will not take any more shit from this serial killer. I'm so scared right now. <laughs> Look. Michaela? Shit. Do you want to go with Harry? I'm sorry. Stay in character. Phone's off, but it's a matter of life and death. You bitches are crazy. <laughs> we used to be the same, you and me. Do you remember our first time? I just want to know what's next for the tragedy girls.
nothing. The blood? Heavy flow day. I don't know if that's not how that works, right? Um, yeah, so that one you can see squarely, right? Right audience, right there. So that gives you a bit of the gunpowder flavor as to where we're going. Uh, this is currently playing in theaters nationwide. The, it is a, what I would call a cult horror. The, it's major festival play, winning audience awards everywhere. I think I am about 30 years too old for the movie, but everyone that works in the office loves it. And those of us on the older end of the spectrum were like, what? Um, but the kids love it. Um, and so we marketed that way. So it's been heavy on Instagram, especially um, for this film, uh, as well as Facebook. The uh, notice this part featuring the song. Do you notice the song? It's pretty cool, right? We, we went to a lot of effort for that song. The, col um, the band is super cool. They're really behind it. Uh, you will notice if you watch the new Foster the People video, they are also in it. Um, Converse, as you saw, is also behind it. There's a lot of um, interesting little twists in it. Craig Robinson uh, is from Pittsburgh. We're also playing Pittsburgh this weekend, and there's been a huge shout out. He's doing Q&As there. It's been very interesting. The two girls you probably don't recognize. One is in um, Deadpool right now, and one is in X-Men. So they're definitely kind of up and coming and known, known among that uh, area um, and among those folks. This is another film where most distributors would have done it day and date. And we didn't. Because again, we're doing, we're uh, really having fun with the marketing and we're seeing it all the way through. This is not going to go to iTunes until January. So we're right in the middle of the theatrical release right now. And we're just nurturing word of mouth all the way through. So it's going to keep doing festivals. It's going to keep running in theaters. I noticed nobody went, but that means you must prefer to go a little bit later tonight, which is fine. Again, Regal, Fenway, tonight. tonight. Um, it's good. And as you can see, it will be going to Hulu later uh, in the spring. How did you find it? We bought it out of South By. Um, so yeah. It was, um, it was super interesting. And one of the things we actually liked about it was the music, which is why I mentioned it. The, the music is super cool. The soundtrack is really good. And a lot of the bands that are involved are helping to kind of go out to the, to the community for it. And South By, obviously, is music and film. So that kind of, it was a natural, uh, natural home for it. Um, yeah, and there you are. So this is fun and probably gives you the best idea of where we're headed with the brand. This has been our first year as a studio releasing content. Um, this time next year, you and I will probably have a better idea and have more pieces of evidence about where we're going as a studio. We just finished shooting our first five feature films we've made this year. None of them are released yet. So our own original ones, as opposed to these, which we bought. Um, so you'll be seeing those coming out in 2018. And uh, if you have feedback, let me know. I look forward to it. But um, I think the one thing I want to leave you guys with is how we see the world at Gunpowder. And I'd be curious to he hear your thoughts if we have time or uh, anyone wants to have a little chat after. So I see uh, Gunpowder is really, we're positioning ourselves as the start of the, the new studio system. So if you look at the, what I would call like this first version of the studios way back when, the production entity of the studio was obviously integrated all the way through to exhibition because they were allowed to own theaters. Then, of course, that law, the, through the law, they were broken. And then the studios are the system that all of us here kind of grew up with. So studios that largely were doing all the production, financing, and distribution to the theaters themselves, but never had any connection with the consumer. So you had to put it up on the theater and let Regal or AMC or whoever tell you what was going on. Now, in the new version, the new studios that are forming, everyone has a direct relationship with the consumer. Amazon, Netflix, I wouldn't call a studio, um, but they're obviously almost one. Facebook, they're already making original content. Apple has a direct relationship. Google has a direct relationship. AT&T, the corporate family that Gunpowder is part of, through your phone relationship. Verizon, Time Warner was not a relationship. It's now inside AT&T. 
Universal was not, but it's inside Comcast, has a direct relationship through cable. So all the studios now are actually able to know the end viewer. And what does that mean in terms of the content that you can make and how you can distribute it? We, don't, we no longer have to be in an era where it's like, we're going to spend all this money and like spaghetti against the wall and hope that the movie sticks. And if it doesn't, whoops, we lost all that money. We're not there anymore. And so what we're setting ourselves up to be is super smart, making smart financial bets, interesting creative bets that are different and not what anyone else is doing, and actually trying to generate a lot of energy for the content and energy in the marketplace to just kind of be like, hey, the rule, these are new rules. We can have new content. We can actually make money as a studio and not be a loss leader in a corporate family forever and kind of do things in a responsible way and have fun doing it and have share great stories while we're at it. So that's all we're trying to do. Um, so if you think you have a cool story for us, let us know. Um, but thanks for listening. Thank you.